Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar. We are going to get started in just a couple of minutes. Um, so while people are joining, I want to go ahead and start out with a few housekeeping items. Let's see if I can get this slide to advance. There we go. Yay. So uh, for those who would like, we will be having a live transcript. So there will be the um, captioning at the bottom of the screen. Usually you can see the icon for that at the bottom of um, your Zoom screen. Um, we will not be, um, we will have all attendees in listen only mode today. And so we ask that you please use the Q&A function, another one of those icons at the bottom of the screen. Um, it would um, use that if you have any kind of um, issues with the hearing the speaker or seeing the slides. And also most importantly, if you have any questions. So we will not be answering questions during the presentations. We're gonna save those for the end when we hope to have a complete discussion. Uh, the chat is view only today and um, please do check that out because we will be sharing links for the um, different websites that we're gonna be mentioning today. And in case you have missed anything um, or if you have to leave early or anything, we will be sending out a link to each person who was registered for today's webinar, and you will be able to see the recording and share that with others. So before we get started, we'd like to find out who is here today. So we're going to um, start out with a poll, which Leanna will be um, putting up. There we go. So. Um, we would like to know who is here today. Can you please choose all that apply from the list that you see on your screen? Okay, it looks like, oh, we have uh, more than half of the folks uh, self-identify as public health workers and public health professionals. And then we have about a quarter of the people are um, have had cancer and um, more than a quarter, as most of us have had a family member or someone that we care about has had cancer. So that's um, pretty representative. Okay. Great. Um, we have one more question for you now. And we would like to know what it is that brings you here to today's webinar. So what it is that you're interested in learning about that we can make sure that we uh, focus on the topics that you are most interested in. Okay, it looks like um, most people, uh, well, three quarters are wanting to know how to reduce the environmental risk factors for breast cancer. And um, a good number of people also want to know how the environment affects breast cancer and why some communities are more impacted. So, wow, and how to better serve our communities. Perfect. It sounds like everybody is in the right place. So, without further ado, then. Let's go ahead and if I can once again get the slide to advance. We'll go ahead and get started. So we're going to start the recording now. And 
I want to welcome everyone today to our webinar, Our Environment and Breast Cancer, Working for a Healthier Future. Uh, we are pleased to have you here today to join the discussion. And my name is Katherine Thompson. I will be moderating and also sharing some information about uh, what my organization is doing. So before um, we go into the content, I want to acknowledge that the Zero Breast Cancer offices and our staff are on Ohlone, Pomo, Wapo, and Coastal Miwok tribal territories. We name these tribes to protect and honor the peoples of these places where we work and live, and hope that this acknowledgement of the land will inspire others to stand in, with us in solidarity with these and other um, uh, American Indian Native tribes and nations. So for in case you are not familiar with zero breast cancer, uh, 25 years ago, a group of otherwise healthy women got together around a kitchen table and decided that they wanted to figure out why they had gotten breast cancer. And they also wanted to know what they could do to help to protect their daughters, nieces, and future generations from the disease. So we have, over those 25 years, been focusing on many things that we can control that might impact our breast cancer risk, as well as the systemic issues that affect our health. So we recognize that as individuals, we cannot do it all. We need to address the social circumstances, unfairnesses, the issues that will weaken the health of specific Americans. So that brings us to health equity. Health equity requires supporting people to overcome unhealthy conditions and barriers to health that affect some groups more than others. So that's the image that we see here on the left. And so you see that people who have um, different height have these boxes to stand on. But what we really need in order to achieve justice is to remove that fence, to remove the barriers from the system. And uh, I want to emphasize that health is not just the absence of disease. It's also about our physical, psychological, social, economic, and spiritual well-being. So all of those things are involved in our health. The um, risk factors that we know about for breast cancer, and this is not a complete list, can um, fall into category of things that we can't control. So things like our genes, our family history, and being female, of course, is one of the biggest risk factors for breast cancer. And then the things that we can change. So um, we've all heard about the need to have a healthy diet, to be physically active, et cetera, in order to be as healthy as possible. However, um, those things that we can change, supposedly, those depend on where we live and where we work and where we pray and play. So the social and built environments that we live in are uh, impacting our health every day. The other thing that they impact, um, the other thing that is impacted that we can change part of are the chemical exposures that we have in our everyday life. And that is gonna be a lot about of what we talk about today for ourselves and for future generations. So um, as I mentioned, there are some things that we can do as individuals. So we, when we are shopping, we can read labels, we can try to choose products that are the healthiest possible. Uh, and, um, a lot of us pay a lot of attention to this. However, there are many things that we cannot um, do alone, and those are the system changes. So those require us to be working together. So I may, for example, live in a place where they have manufactured chemicals in the past and where toxic chemicals are being released into the air or the water, and I cannot um, change that by myself. So we cannot just buy our way out of the, um, these problems and we need to work on the systems to be able to fix what has been um, done in the past. So we need to know and work on neighborhood, local, city, state, and even the federal level to try to make these changes. We know 
that there are chemicals that can cause cancer. Um, we have, for example, seen that cigarettes cause cancer, and those um, are widely, still widely used, and vaping, of course, has increased, and so that is also um, carcinogenic. And it, so um, we do know that there are uh, other chemicals, and unfortunately, many of these are not regulated. Asbestos, for example, since 2002, people have been trying to get asbestos out of use in the United States. And it is a known, car uh, it's one kind of asbestos is known to cause lung cancer, and yet it is still being used. And 200 metric tons were imported into the United States last year of the worst kind of asbestos. So um, we are still trying to figure out which chemicals actually might cause cancer or can cause cancer. The International Agency on Cancer Research, um, IARC, has looked at more than a thousand chemicals, and they found that um, about 10% of those um, are, are known to cause cancer. And um, about half of those, we don't actually have enough information to know whether or not they might cause cancer. Um, only one chemical, the last time I looked, had been found to not cause cancer. So there is still a lot to be done. And here in the United States, we have uh, organizations that regulate chemicals like the Environmental Protection Agency and others. Unfortunately, out of the 80,000 chemicals that are in, um, and more than 80,000 chemicals that are in commerce that are commonly used in the United States and around the world, only um, a handful of those have been fully tested. And um, we um, need to do more work to figure out what those carcinogenic chem uh, chemicals are, which ones can actually cause uh, cancer in human beings. Well, with breast cancer, um, it is a, what we call a hormonal cancer. So we know that the chemicals that can impact our hormones which are sometimes called endocrine disrupting chemicals, that these have a potential to increase the risk of breast cancer. Our um, partners at Silent Spring Institute have been working to look at the information in animals um, testing and in other kinds of testing for many years. And earlier this year, they um, took a look at the EPA data. So our federal government data um, testing uh, uh, about a thousand chemicals. And of those, they found that 296 chemicals actually increase hormone production and that's estrogen and progesterone. progesterone. So um, most of us who know somebody with breast cancer have heard that the cancer can be classified into uh, whether or not it is estrogen or progesterone hormone receptor positive. So we know that these chemicals have an effect on the risk for breast cancer and on the ability for the cancer to progress. Of those um, chemicals that Silent Spring looked at uh, earlier this year, these a lot of these were very common chemicals that are being used in pesticides, consumer products, food additives, and some are in the drinking water. So we know that these might be able to increase um, our estrogen and progesterone levels, and um, only 30 of these had been identified in the past as affecting the breast. We have at Zero Breast Cancer been really fortunate to work with an amazing group of people um, at the Child Health and Development Studies. They um, have built on information that, uh, that they have been doing for many years on a study that we have worked with them on over the past three years. So the um, over the years, we have been looking to see what chemicals may be involved in breast cancer causation um, or in increasing the risk. And the folks that we are working with, their partners at CHDS, they found um, because they have a 
study that in, uh, started recruiting women back in 1959 and um, had several thousand women involved, they found that these women who had their blood taken around the time when they were giving birth in the late 50s and early 60s, they looked to see what levels of different chemicals they had in their bodies. And one of the things they found was DDT, which was being commonly used at the time to control mosquitoes, especially for malaria uh, prevention. They um, found that the DDT exposure in those women who had, were giving birth at that time led to um, a greatly increased risk of um, breast cancer. And in fact, the risk of breast cancer for women before menopause, when it is much less common, was five times greater among the women who had been exposed to DDT earlier in life, so before their 20s. They also then went on, our partner have gone on um, to do follow-up studies, and they found that DDT exposure um, in those women might affect the children and even the grandchildren of the women who were in the study. So um, the picture here on the left shows that uh, a woman who is pregnant is exposed, when she is exposed to a chemical, like a cigarette as shown here, that she is not only exposing herself, but of course she is also exposing the fetus. Now the um, fetus, a, a female fetus is actually born with all of the egg cells, the um, reproductive um, cells that she's going to have for her entire life. So that cigarette smoke is not only affecting the mother and the fetus, but also those eggs that were are um, in the fetus. So that's that third generation, the granddaughter's generation. And the, um, to look at how this effect of uh, DDT exposure in the grandmothers might uh, um, affect the grandchildren, the Child Health and Development Studies went uh, um, and looked at, they've been following these people now for 60, 70 years. So they were able to identify the granddaughters, uh, recruit them in and start to look at things like um, their, their height and weight, their, um, their rate of puberty. And what they found in the very first study to report on human health effects of exposure to toxic environmental chemicals over three generations, so that's from the grandmothers down to the granddaughters, um, they found that the granddaughters whose grandmothers had the highest levels of DDT at the time around when they were giving birth, those granddaughters had two to three times greater obesity than those with less um, DDT in their systems. And twice they were twice as likely to have early puberty. So what we have done uh, with these partners in the study is even before they had those findings, we recruited some of those people to, who were in the study from all generations to look at those endocrine disrupting chemicals and how we might be able to protect future generations from those um, chemicals that like DDT can affect our hormones. So, we brought representatives from those three generations together. We selected a target audience. They thought it would be good to focus on young adults before they conceive, before they even think about having babies. And we wanted to make sure um, that our work engage was engaging to people of color, those who may not be thinking about having children, and people who identify as LGBTQ. So we worked with designers and advisory group on messaging and images. And then we held focus groups and had interviews with diverse young people. And what we came up with then was this campaign. We have um, these six posters now that were developed and we are rolling those out in our generations campaign, which is just launching today. So, um, it is now live, here's the information about it. 
And I will just quickly say that we have already done some evaluation. We found, just quickly go through it, we found that most people who we um, surveyed online, so who did not know about our project, they trusted the information coming from us and from the study um, researchers. They also, with this particular poster, the first one that we've um, looked at, 80% of the people were more likely to choose organic and they found the messages clear. And surprisingly, 60% said that they would click on a QR code or go to our website to find out more information. So we hope that you will check out our um, Generations campaign, which is now live. The link is there. And I know that Leanna is also putting it into the chat. So please check that out. We are already working on funding to try to get this out into places, especially lower income uh, communities. So buses, um, commuter trains, and the stations, as well as we would love to have hard copies, um, posters put up in medical offices and um, distributed at schools, community colleges, et cetera. So, um, that was a lot to try to cover. I don't want to take up any more time. Now I really want to introduce our amazing speakers for today who are doing their own great work to reduce exposure to toxic chemicals. And we're going to start out today with and say uh, Witherspoon, who is with the Children's Environmental Health Network. And then we will have Daisy Flores, who is with Make the Road New York. Both of these amazing women are partners of ours in the Cancer Free Economy Network. And you can find their full bio sketches on our website. Uh, our organization that will be in the chat. So, uh, Ense, would you please take it away? Thank you so much, Catherine. So excited to be here. Good afternoon, everyone. Just gonna share my slides and we'll be off to the races here. I thought that Catherine provided a very good overview uh, for you and a great foundation. So I will try to jumpstart from that and talk a bit more about um, how you know, we are moving uh, at the Children's Environmental Health Network to protect all, all populations, especially our most vulnerable. And keep in mind in my presentation that overall vulnerability and overall protections for our youngest and our most vulnerable create protective standards for, for all of us. Our mission at the Children's Environmental Health Network, uh, we're almost 30 years old, which is amazing. We got our start out in the Bay Area in the late 80s, has always been to protect the developing child and, um, and, and fetus. We do include mom womb as the first environment from all known environmental hazards. And that means when we know better, we must do better. Uh, we pro uh, stimulate prevention oriented research and at times we're a part of that. We, a big part of our work is translating uh, available science into education and training and activating um, a base of all different types of, of populations. Anyone that has time, five minutes all the way through to more time, we will find something for you to do. And of course we do work on child protective policies, which is the hardest or most time uh, consuming part of our work, but definitely uh, one that we don't shy away from at the state and the federal level. Okay. Uh, do wanna keep in mind that um, a lot of what Catherine was talking about, we are not talking about a situation where we're all individually looking at individual chemicals. We're actually looking at, if you will, a toxic soup, the cumulative effects. Uh, sadly, we do know that children are born pre-polluted. So, uh, talk about that as far as you know, starting off on your human journey. By the time you're born, uh, if bioassays were taken, you actually already have evidence of some forms of chemicals. And that's because of, unfortunately, what mom has been exposed to. And we do know science shows us what dad also um, has been exposed to early in, in his life also can be seen in their young children, which is amazing. But we want to definitely also very much strength um, and focus in on the inequities that also drive our work. So it's not so easy to just slap on a specific recommendation and just say, for example, if climate implications are happening, then one can just pick up and move and they can just migrate uh, or they can just you know, afford those uh, fruits and vegetables right now that are a little pricier maybe because they're organic and our standards and our political will need to continue to drive those prices down for some families. Or they cannot just go and buy bottled water if there's 
an issue with water at the time of their community and on and on. We have to think about those inequities in that fence that Catherine talked about and make sure that those are driving all related solutions while protecting everyone. So the Cancer Free Economy Network that Catherine mentioned, we have also been a part of that a good seven years. It is an amazing effort that I might say, our guiding star is that within a generation, we will lift the burden of cancers and other diseases by driving a dramatic and equitable transition from toxic substances in our lives, communities, and economy to safe and healthy alternatives for all. Our basic guidance here is that, you know, we do focus a lot on treatment and that is necessary and that is vital, but a lot, majority of our money and our attention, at least in the US is focused on treatment. We are not acknowledging the available science that shows us in many cases, we can actually prevent harm and exposure and the likelihood or higher risk of a cancer diagnosis of, or other long-term illnesses. So we have taken a while in this systems thinking, looking at how did we get here and our dependency on fossil fuel and production of, of chemicals and our commerce have gotten us here. And there are benefits to that. And then there are these negative sides of this and we need to acknowledge where those are so that we can also reverse course. So we have a building power section of our work that Daisy, who's gonna be talking about next is a big leader in. We have a health and science side of our work that I'm a part of uh, along with Silent Spring Institute and University of Massachusetts at Lowell among many other wonderful groups, bringing the science in, translating the science and helping to have that foundation for our work moving forward. We have a shifting market. So again, the economic side of this is a big piece. If you're not acknowledging the economic drivers to how we are so dependent on chemicals, you know, that is part of it. Well, what about the green chemistry? What about the safer alternatives that we've been talking about? It's, it's one thing to remove certain chemicals from a certain consumer product. It's another thing to then offer up what is the viable solution that is not gonna be what is called a regrettable substitution. We also have a lot of uh, communications, effective communications, changing this narrative, again, from treatment only to also balance out to acknowledging uh, prevention. And then of course, a whole policy legal side to our work as well, which is also vital. And in that case, the policy legal team did help us pull together a Build Back Better uh, Cancer Economy brief and memo that was shared with the Biden administration and that has a huge justice lens to it. It's online for us. It will definitely share some websites. And then uh, one of our leaders, Captain Alankar, from um, uh, our, one of our uh, wonderful public uh, uh, policy uh, organizations in California, uh, did talk that there's a great need to fix the damage done to public health and environmental protections during the previous administration. So we're acknowledging that we're coming into a very uh, awkward and challenging situation because of a lot of damage done by the previous administration. But there's an even, an even greater need to go beyond repairs and to build regulatory structure that frees all people from the burden of toxic exposures. We all believe it is a basic right that you should have access to uh, not being uh, harmed by going about the daily business, eating the food you eat, drinking the water you drink, living in the house that you live in, going to school, that kind of thing. And this is another uh, resource, a path to cancer prevention and our agenda uh, for an environment for the Biden-Harris administration. So again, acknowledging that a lot of the disproportionate implica implications to COVID that we've been seeing very much outline and further exacerbate what we've already been seeing around the environmental injustice of exposures when it comes to environmental exposures. Uh, so that was just um, another example of how we need to get serious in, among these urgencies. Another example is the Childhood Cancer Prevention Initiative. So this is a, collab a unique collaboration of, these are a few of the leading organizations. We're talking about business, sustainable business leaders, health professional leaders, uh, basically economic leaders, certainly public health and, and um, environmental health protection leaders coming together uh, with the idea that again, the science is showing us, we have a report that we released last uh, September that there are certain environmental exposures that children are exposed to that are being linked to childhood cancers. In fact, the trends have been increasing in incidence periodically for every year since 1975. And we do show in our report that exposure to certain pesticides, again, pretty similar to what Catherine talked about earlier, near traffic air pollution, so vehicle emission air pollution and paints and solvents are the biggest routes of exposures. So what we do believe is that childhood cancer can actually be prevented in many cases. We need to be thinking about pro, uh, pr purchasing um, and producing chemicals that are actually safe from the beginning and not putting the burden and responsibility on parents and grandparents and community members to decipher what products are gonna be healthy and not. 
We need to be investing in prevention research, right? Right now, the National Cancer Institute's portfolio on prevention is extremely small compared to treatment. We need to be advancing public policy and incentivizing uh, our businesses to, to have safer chemicals and products in the first place. And also we wanna be support and expand regulations that will reduce known causes. So looking at the policy case, we know we have precedence here that public policy actually does work. When all of our voices become aligned, when we really start rattling the trees, change can happen. Kids stuffed animals at one point were made with oily rags and now they're made with fresh clean uh, instead. Products made for babies and toddlers do not anymore intentionally include small parts that they can now choke on. New York City does not get smog like this photo in this, uh, in this uh, slide here. And of course we have seatbelt laws, for example. Also, the lead uh, prevention situation, this is a dose response, right? So when uh, lead was taken out of our gasoline, out of our paint, uh, and there were bans and use for residents, there was a dr dramatic reduction in the amount of blood lead levels that children were experiencing. Uh, that was a direct dose response. Now we're not there yet and we still have some work to do, but that's a huge amount of protected children and neurodevelopmental protections. Government must fulfill their obligation to prevent cancers. Uh, by protecting existing and recent um, existing federal laws from rollbacks, right? By holding the US Environmental Protection Agency accountable, by enforcing existing regulations, by expanding our air quality and our water protections, that's for everyone's benefit, by requiring the reduction or elimination of pesticide use because of its direct relationship to cancer and other uh, neurodevelopmental delays, and requiring use of safer materials in children's products in our built environment, and overall eliminating known toxics. Using government and institutional dollars is extremely important to think about where purchasing is going and ensuring that the places where children spend the most time are actually cited safely. Requiring transparent disclosure of chemicals of concern in products and in areas intended for use of children and other vulnerable populations. And of course, capacity, right? Funding has to be available for cancer prevention research. The bottom line is that government has a fundamental obligation to protect the well being of our public and our shared environment, and both of which are profoundly at risk due to the ways in which chemicals are manufactured, used, and released currently. Our policies that restrict harmful chemicals and drive our economy towards safer solutions are essential. We need those motivators um, if we are serious truly about preventing debilitating and deadly diseases like cancers and long-term illnesses. And just mentioning this, you can go to cehday.org or cehn.org, our website, to learn more about joining our movement, again, which is a benefit for all populations, starting with children, but of course, providing protections for everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nancy. I think I'm going next. And hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Daisy Flores. I'm the supervisor of the Workers' Health and Safety Program at Major Room New York. Uh, thank you to the Zero Risk Cancer Organization for inviting me to join uh, this amazing conversation. I am going to start introducing you all uh, Major Room New York. Major Room New York is the largest nonprofit organization in New York City that works towards building the power of the Latinx and working class communities to achieve dignity and justice through organizing policy innovation, transformative education, and survival services. Uh, I'm going to be sharing with you specifically the work that we do through our Make the Road in Your Health Department and more concrete, concretely the work that we do at the Health and Safety Program. Uh, we are focusing two areas of work, which is the Health and Safety Training and Environmental Justice Research Project, which I'm, I'm going to be sharing with you. The Health and Safety Training um, I started many years ago and Make the Road currently provides OSHA training and OSHA Oh, 30 hours construction and general industry training for Spanish speaking workers. Um, some of the content includes workers' rights, hazard assessment, personal protective equipment, among others uh, specific to the industry. We have been training thousands of workers uh, so far, and it's this is such an important uh, type of job that the organization does, allowing our uh, members and our community to be aware about the rights that they have, but also how to protect themselves and be safe at the workplace. Uh, 
Due to the pandemic, all of our OSHA classes now are happening uh, online and all of them are free. And also we have started doing a COVID-19 training and resiliency training in order to um, support the mental health of the workers that were participating in our trainings. Uh, just to give you some background, also part of our health and safety program has been um, connected to what happened a few years ago when the superstorm Sandy hit in New York and 500 workers were trained. And we also strengthened collaborations with many academic institutions. And that's when the idea came up about working further in terms of uh, exploring and, and researching the exposures that workers are um, directly exposed to the work that they do. Um, and that's how the Safe and Just Cleaners project came up. This is an uh, academic worker center collaboration to improve health and safety of Latinx household cleaners in New York City. Uh, this is, we're working with our partners from Queens College, the City University of New York, and the Icon School of Medicine on Mount Sinai. This is our research team. And the main goal of this project is to under understand exposure to cleaning chemicals and disinfectants among Latinx and immigrant household cleaners in New York City and Westchester and reduce future health impacts. Since we are talking in this conversation specifically about equity and how some communities, especially communities of color, are more impacted by environmental health issues. This project is a good example of that. And I'm going to be sharing some findings that we got through our research. The project aims were uh, initially three um, to conduct a survey, to do an exposure assessment, and to organize a campaign initiatives. Uh, this is the profile of the household cleaners that we have interviewed in New York City. We have interviewed 400 household cleaners in New York City and Westchester. The average age is 45 years old. All of them are immigrants, mainly from Mexico and Ecuador. On average, they have lived in the U.S. Uh, for about 16 years, so they are not new to the country. And 38% felt uncomfortable with English, with speaking English. Some research findings, which is like... Um, I'm going to be highlighting a few of them since we got like a full data report and we got a lot of data. I invite you to check out our full report later. But this is what we got so far. Um, the working conditions are very precarious of this type of job. For example, 76% of them are self-employed and 93% of them had no formal reading contract, which is very concerning because they only have like verbal agreements or text messages and there is not evidence of the arrangements that they do they have with their employers. And also 49% of them have experienced wage thief or have been paid below the minimum wage at some point. In terms, in terms of uh, health coverage, um, we got that nearly 50% of them uh, don't have any type of health coverage and 85% of them did not receive any paid sick leave. Um, while 46% of them felt that actually they could not take sick leave without reprisal. This is interesting and specifically connected to what we are talking about in terms of work-related health conditions. And these are workers that are exposed to these strong chemicals that are on clean products. And the main three health-related uh, uh, outcomes that we found is uh, connected to skin, eye irritation, and musculoskeletal disorders. 27% complain of a skin rash that improves when they are away from work. And this is three times higher than the rates of a skin rash, rash showing in all US workers based on a national survey using the same survey question. 74% complain of some eye irritation while working, and some of them also reported that they had to leave the room where they were cleaning. 62% of them reported experiencing most musculoskeletal pain during the previous months that last longer than, than a day. Uh, while our study is not necessarily focused specifically on, on cancer, um, I think further, um, we think that further research is needed to really assess the impact of these cleaning products on health, uh, workers' health. Uh, our study is more focused specifically on understanding the exposures that they have and the working practices.
Some key findings that we got, uh, house of cleaning is mostly conducted alone part-time in multiple homes without a formal reading contract and low paid. Many cleaners in our study do not earn enough income to cover basic expenses. On average, they are far less likely to have health insurance. And as I mentioned, they are exposed to these strong chemicals. Um, on top of the research uh, that we've been doing originally, when COVID-19 started, we also got a supplemental grant that allowed us to collect data about the impact of COVID-19 on our the participants of our study. And what we found is that 54% of participants reported having had COVID, which is higher than what the CDC estimates. And also, we sent out to the participants antibody tests, and based on the results of the antibody tests, we estimate that between 55% and 70% of the cleaners in our study had COVID, which is higher and concerning. And these are the results of the antibody test uh, from the ones that reported that they did not have, have COVID, and 29% of them actually had it, and had antibodies by the time that they performed the test. Um, this is also another concerning. Um, data related to the increased use of disinfectants. You probably have been exposed to all of these advertisements about the, the importance of using uh, more disinfectants due to COVID-19. Uh, however, um, this has been a, an, an issue that we've been very concerned about because that only increased the exposure of cleaners to these strong chemicals. And what we found is that 59% of them reported using more disinfectants at work and 65% of them started using more disinfectants at their home. Uh, the impact on housing and household um, economy, um, by the time that we have interviewed them, 37% of them were with high no rent, and 80% of them reported that their income has decreased. So the impact on housing and economy has been huge. And we also collected data about uh, mental health. And what we've seen is that depression and stress levels um, definitely were impacted. And uh, as you can see here, increase um, due to the um, during the pandemic. Um, we've been working through Make the Road about different uh, using the social ecological framework that you all are familiar with. Um, and we've been working on doing educational activities, organizing, but also demanding policies to address some of these issues. So in 2018, we created a super cleaners group. This is a safe space for household cleaners to meet, learn, and work together to increase awareness about environmental toxics. And more importantly, as I mentioned earlier, this type of work is performed a lot, so alone. So it's a very type of isolated type of work. So it's being important for uh, them to create this space where they can meet, gather, and uh, start getting to know each other and developing their organizing skills. We had... Um, develop the a curriculum about safety considerations while using how, uh, household clean chemicals and this has been done in collaboration with the national domestic workers alliance we did like a train the trainers program and now those trainers are delivering online training to other household cleaners in new york um, also during the pandemic, uh, La Super Cleaners uh, group leaders created educational videos or that those you can be found on our website. And most of them were about how to clean during COVID-19, how to use properly disinfectants, and also some recommendations related to mental health care. Uh, this year, we also launched our a safe and just cleaning awareness campaign, which consists of a series of workshops and activities focused on building awareness about environmental toxins. And we've been having those workshops on a monthly basis. Um, part of our work has been also strengthening collaborations towards reducing exposures. So we, as Make the Road, we're a very active member of the Cancer Free Economy Network. And since 2019, we've been having support from then. Um, specifically support they've been supporting specifically the safe and just cleaners campaign initiatives recently we just launched the house of cleaner safety lab which is a cross node collaboration committed to designing and testing solutions for reducing exposure to cleaning products among household cleaners and this has been a very interesting collaboration because now the network at large is fully committed to supporting these initiatives and also uh, in, term, in order to address the huge impact that the pandemic had in our communities and specifically in these workers and communities of colors, um, the La Super Cleaners group has been, have been supporting legislative initiatives to address the impact of COVID-19. There are two um, main initiatives that 
and campaigns that we won um, recently. And one of them is the Funnest Coolest Workers uh, campaign, which appropriated $2.1 billion for economic support for immigrant undocumented workers. This has been an unprecedented um, uh, achievement that we had here, and some of the cleaners of our study also benefit from this uh, program. Also, we supported the rent relief program that secured 2.4 million, which covers up to 12 months of back rent or utility bills. Also, these, uh, through this program, uh, many workers were protected and in, in pro evictions were prohibited during this time as well. Uh, key final considerations, um, based on what we've got and what we learned through our research, economic insecurity, lack of health coverage and poor worker conditions are factors that threaten workers' health and safety. Research findings help to advocate for policies that can benefit uh, directly our participants. COVID-19 has highlighted the urgency to increase health and safety protections at the workplace, particularly for workers like the cleaners of our study who are workers at risk and that uh, are working in this informal industry. Workers organizing truly works. All victories and campaigns are um, that we won last year are the result of multiple actions and have been led by community organizations and workers are experiencing now what we've seen is high levels of stress due to the COVID-19 pandemic so accessible mental health services and programs are needed and this should be also under the the approach that it, it's it's part of our equity work that we are pushing forward uh, this, our health and safety program, Make the Road, is being supported by like many partners, like the National Institute of Environmental Health and Science, the Tony Masaki Center, the Cancer Free Economy Network, the Labor Institute, among other organizations. Thank you very much for your attention, and thank you again to Catherine and Leanne for inviting me to share the work that we're doing. Thank you so much, Daisy and Ense. Those were amazing. Um, presentations, so much excellent information. We have some questions already, and I'm going to go ahead and show a couple of slides while we um, about what we can do. So let me share my screen again. Um, while we were uh, talking, we I uh, got a, we got a question about the. Silent Spring study that was done. So I pasted that into the chat. So that is now there. Um, let me see if I can get to share my screen again. And then I will get back to. Okay, so oops, not from the beginning. Um, so the first thing that we wanted to talk about, though, is um, the things that we can actually do. We have a list on our um, on us the next slide about the the activities that we can take um, as individuals and as um, a groups. So the first one, if I can just get to the right spot. Let me move this up. Um, so while I'm pulling that up though, um, I had a question for you, Daisy, and I was wondering if you could tell us, you talked about the workers being mostly self-employed, the majority. So. Um, with them being self-employed, how can, um, do they have any options of using healthier cleaners? Because, you know, you're doing these trainings about healthier cleaners, especially with people wanting, you know, stronger disinfectants. Even though we know that COVID, we have not seen any cases that have been spread by touch. Um, so the surface cleaning is not the big issue that we thought. So um, is it something that um, where people have any option themselves about, about choosing the cleaners? Um, 
That's such a great question, Katrin. Um, we've been doing a lot of educational activities with the participants of our study. However, when we collected the information from our first survey, what we learned is that nearly 60% of the cleaners reported that they don't have any autonomy or agency in choosing the products that they use. That means that employers are the ones who provide the clean products. And that also, it is very complex to address these issues because we also need to increase awareness among like everyone, including employers, uh, about like, how these chemicals impact their health and specifically these workers, because if cleaners don't have the opportunity to choose what type of products they are going to be using, that also uh, limits their action. So we are trying to encourage them to open the discussion and to start talking with their employers about these issues. But also we know that there is like language barriers and some of them don't feel comfortable enough to raise these issues because they don't want to lose their jobs. And what we found is that also employers, according to the uh, information that cleaners reported, are basically giving to them the cheapest products. That means the products that contain the strongest chemicals. So they are not buying these safer alternatives, even though when there is like still so much research that has to be done in terms of proving that, that those safer alternatives are actually safer. And that's something that NC also mentioned on her presentation. So talking about environmental exposures, exposure to chemicals is a very complex issue because there are so many factors that are around and, and that many pieces that we need to understand in order to make some systemic change. So I think I, I do agree that change has to be systemic if we really want to um, um, improve the conditions, uh, the working conditions of these workers. And um, NC, could you go? Uh, could you talk a little bit about um, how the um, trying to get the information out to people about these chemicals, and especially, you know, with the Childhood Cancer Initiative, these are people who are parents and you know caregivers, and so you would think this might be a time in life where people would be more sensitive to the idea of toxic chemicals being used and more open to uh, the possibility of using less toxic products? Thank you so much. I'll say first as a mom of four, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm a mom first, right? Um, I care about the kids we're raising. I care about all children. That's why I'm doing this work. It really does boggle your mind uh, when you do think about the fact that other parts of the world, Europe, for example, have been so much further advanced. No one's perfect, but they've at least acknowledged that we cannot keep going down the same rabbit hole, the same process of uh, assuming that chemicals are safe and then retroactively finding out through adults, adolescents, and now children that that's not the case. And then in the meantime, you have all an array of stress. Another part of that presentation that we normally do with more time is the layers of stress. If there's any cancer survivors on the line, you understand what we're talking about. You're of course grateful that you are a cancer survivor, but it's certainly not a walk in the park. And imagine that for a family dealing with a very young child, it is not behavior. It is not drinking, smoking, other lifestyle changes. That child at that time, uh, you know, and potentially uh, many of these other complexities that we're talking about and that family still has to deal with that stress. So first and foremost, uh, you know, you have a lot of families that are still trying to find answers, right? Um, there, th we may not have the exact answer for their specific situation, because again, these are multiple <laughs> um, synergistic type of things happening, but it, ha it does cause pause. It certainly does cause families when they go through such a traumatic experience like that. Hey, we have other children. How do we protect them? Uh, or, you know, grandmother or other vulnerable or immunocompromised people in our family. So for people to take stock and, and to really uh, look at their personal experiences. That's one way that people connect to these issues. That's not the way though, that we want people to have to do it. We would rather, families have a lot to deal with. They have a lot of decisions to make. The COVID pandemic has only further exemplified the fact people are stressed uh, justifiably. How do we alleviate the burdens so that any one of us going into a, a grocery store don't have to spend 20 minutes going down the laundry aisle to figure out which detergent is going to be relatively okay and not cause harm. It shouldn't be that hard, right? Um, so the onus, the responsibility needs to be totally reversed. Right now, the onus of responsibility is on all of us to read labels, good luck. Sometimes the labels just send you to a website that is not productive, right? And even bigger than that, more upstream than that is we just need to do the right thing as a society, put the pressure on industry and other 
uh, sources of pollution to ensure that the right rigorous uh, studies are conducted to look at health implications and that of vulnerable populations before any type of chemical is introduced in our commerce. Bottom line, understanding that's not as easy as it said because it is economically driven. So there, it then comes back to going back to that one slide I had is that there's precedence here. It seems overwhelming, it seems daunting, but there have been time and time again, examples, babies, bottles, for example, used to have bisphenol A, another type of uh, known uh, carcinogen and other uh, awful things it does to your body. It was the groundswell of the public that went to the baby manufacturers and insisted that something changed because they were no longer gonna use their product if they could not conf uh, um, confirm that young children would not be exposed 10, 20, you know, 15 years down the road. We saw a change, right, in that industry because of the political demand. So with the power is with us, uh, making sure that we're writing those letters and uh, continuously keeping in communication with our legislative leaders. They're there because we put them there, our school boards, our county meetings, our PTAs, it all really does make a difference. Yes, thank you so much. That is so true. Um, I wanna read out one of the questions. I mean, I have so many more questions for you myself, um, but one of uh, Maria Guerra asked, is there any awareness training going out to the employers to show that safer options, um, not only for the employees, but also um, and their families, but also then in the homes uh, where they, the employers, are um, gonna be affected by the chemicals. So is there any attempt to try to um, reach those people um, from the organization and not just have the individual employees talk to them? Yeah, thank you to Maria Guerra, right, for that question. That's something actually that we are now exploring with the collaborations that we are building with the Council Free Economy Network. And when we recently launched this initiative, which is the House of Cleaner Safety Lab, and we we have identified that definitely that there are many uh, actions that have that need to happen at the same time. We are actively working with the workers, but we need to raise like awareness among like employers about like importance of changing the behavior, their behavior and choosing like safer alternatives. So that's something that we're exploring right now uh, through this uh, new collaboration because we're gonna have like cross node collaboration, which definitely give us the opportunity to expand this information farther than New York City. So just thinking on a national campaign perhaps. And the other uh, project that we're exploring as well is to sharing the valuable information about the importance of reducing the use of disinfectants. Unfortunately, that the pandemic has been the worst in, in that sense because it just increased the use of disinfectants that drastically and that also increased exposure of these workers. Yep, and I will just add that a lot of the same exposures that Daisy's talking about, we are working on with the Eco Healthy Child Care Program because these are mostly women, uh, men also, who uh, have small businesses, many of them working from their home uh, and are certainly employers, right? And, and if you're in a center, same thing. So we're working to train and educate those providers, the owners, the facility managers on low to no cost steps they can take. We're not talking about removing the roof and things like that. Overall, childcare licensing handles basic safety. We're talking about the gaps of understanding between air pollutants and a lot of things happening in the indoor environment, such as cleaners and other uh, pesticide use and things like that. So that's also a huge piece because young children are in those facilities, uh, cognitive learning years, their young brains are developing, and you have the benefit of the employer, the providers themselves, better understanding why these changes are needed for their health and safety and the children that they're serving. That's wonderful. Yeah, that's so important. And I've seen some really nice programs and I just wish we had more time to share them all. But I do wanna go ahead and put in a plug for some of the resources that we have identified and um, ask Liana to put those into the chat. So for example, um, we really would want to encourage people to sign the Cancer-Free Economy Joint Statement as an individual, as an organization, in whatever way. Um, read it, and if it uh, resonates with you, please do sign on. Um, also, we have some, there are some national uh, databases where you can find out what some of the environmental issues are in your area. Purple Air to find out we, when we had the fires here, we had horrible particulate matter in Northern California. Um, so um, that is something that actually is, is nationwide and you can look to see what might be coming from industrial facilities. There are also from the EPA, there's uh, 
uh, site to look at Superfund um, contamination in areas as well as their environmental justice um, screening site, which um, is fairly limited. In California, we are incredibly fortunate to have a Cal Enviro screen, which has much more information and it also provides data in each geographic area by um, whether or not, um, you know, what the population is. So lower income, um, if it's mainly Latino, immigrant populations, et cetera. So these are all really um, wonderful sources of information about what is um, what the problems are. And then it be, it's wonderful to try to hook up with whatever organization um, resonates with you in your area or nationally to be able to um, try to advance this kind of agenda. Because um, as we have all said, we cannot do this alone. This is something that we need to work on on multiple levels. Um, we also recommend the Detox Me app. There's also the Think Dirty and Healthy Living apps, um, which have good information. Um, although I do have to say, even with those, it takes me 15 minutes on the laundry aisle and say to be able to figure out the right product. And um, I am also excited, for example, um, to share the information that Daisy, that you were talking about with. We have an organization here, La Colectiva, which is uh, domestic uh, house cleaners and they work in San Francisco and I wish we had one in the East Bay. Um, let me see uh, what other questions we have here really quick. Um, we would love to work more on specific populations. Um, so uh, Chi Chen Chi, uh, thank you so much for your questions. And yes, we actually, are working on a study right now with people at the University of California, San Francisco about um, breast cancer in um, Asian American women in the greater San Francisco Bay Area and would love to see what can be done in Massachusetts. Um, before I um, run completely out of time, let me see if I can get the slide to advance again. Okay, just quick thing about our contact information. These will all be in the slides and it won't just be our slides from Zero Breast Cancer, but um, Daisy and Ensei's slides will also be uh, linked in the email that we send out afterward. We also have some other projects to work on people um, people's exposure earlier in life at zero breast cancer. So I know that we will make those available as well. And you can go to our website to find out more. And those are in multiple languages. We have English, Chinese, Spanish, everything we do is at least in English and Spanish. But we also have things in Chinese, Tagalog, and coming soon, Arabic. So um, I think we're about out of, we're a little over time, but, um, I want to thank you and any last um, comments or things to share and say. Just thank you. There's some great um, energy in the chat and the questions. And it, it seems like a lot of folks very interested in, uh, you know, trying to connect and do some great work. And believe me, we will find uh, some place to, for your energy. If you want to connect to any of our organizations, uh, we want to get to know you better and some of the work you're doing. So just thank you for your your time and attention and what you're doing each and every day, uh, quite frankly. Um, and thank you to our friends at Zero Breast Cancer for this opportunity and platform. Daisy. Yes, as well, just uh, thank you to everyone that attended this conversation at the beginning. Uh, Catherine asked you like how many of you were, or what are the topics that you were interested? Like in 60% of you said that you were interested in learning about how like these communities are impacted the most. So I hope I could share like a brief example of that, and uh, we really need to keep fighting towards equity. I think no one should be uh, because of their economic situation or because of like 
are part of the communities of color should be impacted by these issues and, and, and in, in, a, in a higher way. So I think there is so much work that can be done. Please be in contact with us and join uh, this movement. And yeah, looking, looking forward to further conversations. Thank you again to the Serious Council Organization and especially to Catherine and Leanne for the invitation. Thank you both so much. I uh, wish we had more time because there's it's such a rich topic and we could talk for days. But um, yes, please do contact us and we'd be happy to try to answer any additional questions. Thank you all so much. Um, just to let you know, we have talked in the past um, about some other topics about how, where people live and their built environment impact risk. Um, how we can all get involved in research and how culture plays a role in breast cancer risk. So um, you can find those links on our website and on our YouTube channel. And we will definitely have this one up as soon as possible. Thank you all so much for joining us and um, please be safe and healthy. <laughs>